Hi there everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and I am bringing you a video called Lost and Found. I wanted to share with you some recent machines that I quote rescued unquote. These are machines that were for sale and some of them are running, some of them are not. Some of them need, um, well they all need a full overhaul and restoration. And I wanted to kind of just give you an overview of some of the machines I'm going to be working on and then you guys can be looking for these when I get ready to make videos on them when the restoration is completed. And uh, some of these will inspire specific videos on restoration techniques. You guys have seen me do videos before uh, uh, talking about how to overhaul a machine. I'm going to try something a little different and do them with certain areas. Um, I'm going to make installments of the videos and uh, I've got a new small tripod here, so I want to see if we can improve the stability of these videos and give you guys some information on what I consider to be common, common things that I typically find in sewing machines. So I just want to kind of go over a few of the models and why I picked them and some of the things that I, that I fully expect to do to these machines before they're ready to be sold and uh, put into the hands of people who really want to sew. The one you're looking at now is a very early Singer Class 15 machine. Uh, I've checked the serial number and it is circa 1904, so about 115 years ago. This machine, cast iron, heavy as, heavy as a log, was produced. And it, <clears throat> of course, very subtly, this is, this is very tarnished brass, but here's the Singer uh, emblem. And this machine, because it was made in 1904, uh, she's covered in dust right now, but of course that'll change. Uh, this machine does not have back tacking. Remember, machines originally, um, this would have been set up in, in a treadle table, and machines did not have back tacking. You could adjust the stitch length, and that's what this little uh, screw here is. You loosen it and you move it. Now, I'm not forcing it because right now, as I loosen this knob, I literally just got this, it's not moving. And that doesn't mean it's broken, it just means it's, it needs to be gone over. One of the things I may have mentioned to you folks before is when I first get a machine, I'm always very cautious about just trying to run it and sew on it. I look at the machine, I start touching it, I start moving, seeing what will move, what will not, and very carefully and gently begin sort of uh, diagnosing the machine, if you will. For example, I just set the foot down and I noticed that uh, it went down slowly. That's probably due to old machine oil. And the foot presser spring may be uh, a little tired. It may need some work. But it looks like all of her parts are there. This machine may go back into a treadle. I suspect it will. It does not have the uh, the hole board in the side and what that tells me is that this machine was never one of those that got converted to electricity in the 20s and 30s <clears throat> but I was drawn to it because it is remarkably tough it is the uh, the good old girl of treadle machines it is tough uh, some of the heaviest fabric you will ever be able to sew with a domestic machine this is one of the machines that can handle it and uh, it also has a very heavy hand wheel. Hand wheels are like flywheels on sewing machines. And as the years went by, the hand wheels got smaller and lighter in weight because they were electrical and a lot of the power would come from the electric motors. But, uh, but this hand wheel, uh, this big heavy hand wheel actually makes for uh, quite, a, quite a lot of torque once you get going on the treadle. But uh, you've seen a machine like this before, or it looked similar to this. It was a 115, and of course it was actually a machine that looked similar, but it had a different shuttle. Anyway, you'll see the old style uh, bobbin winder here, and there's no tire on it right now, but I can get one. I just think it's amazing that something that's 115 years old, I can still get reproduction parts for uh, at least some of them. And so you'll see that here's it's spring-loaded, and the spring is still... Uh, Still working, right? Now it's it's not been lubricated in a while, so I'm being extra gentle, right? You don't ever wanna take something that's been sitting for a long time and force it, right? Very often it gets stiff and it needs to be uh, treated with uh, different lubricants to get the parts just sort of 
woken up, if you will. So this is a machine I will be working on. I'm looking, uh, actually I may have found a treadle table for it. <clears throat> and uh, so this is one I want you guys to be watching for. It has a similar look, although it's decals, what's left of the decals here uh, is, uh, is a different, uh, I think this is the Sphinx decal. It's a different uh, decal look than the 115 was that I have a video on the channel for. And so you guys keep watching for uh, my video for this when I, when I have her done. I, I really love these machines, particularly for people who want to sew heavy material. You could sew tarps with this thing. If you could get it under the foot, you can probably sew with it. It is uh, one of the many models that made Singer very famous. And uh, this model, by the way, would continue into production in various forms with different, different decals and looks, eventually electrified versions, and it was made for a very long time, and it was copied by many manufacturers, which I believe you guys have heard me talk about before. So she looks a little rusty, but most of what you're seeing here is uh, there's a little oxidation on the, on the metal, but I should be able to polish that off. Most of what you're seeing is old sewing machine oil. Like I say, her, her main parts are moving. Anything that's stiff, I'm going to loosen up and, and uh, go through a procedure to get the pieces ready to be cleaned and lubricated. Uh, you know, it's like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz that's been sitting for a long time. You want to give it, you know, give it, be patient with it as you're bringing it back to life in spite of the fact that it's a strong machine. So, uh, moving on to the next find, which is a lot cleaner and shinier. This is a white 164 model. I've had a run recently of white zigzag models. <clears throat> of course, just like with all the other manufacturers, when you went into the white sewing dealer, you had lots of choices. And this was the straight stitch 164 model. And it came, of course, in the gray and white, built with the same quality as the zigzag machines but it was lower in price because it was mechanically, you know, somewhat simpler. Now you might wonder, well, why did the original owners want a straight stitch machine by the 60s? You know, zigzag was out. You have to remember that people were creatures of habit and tradition. And many people, you know, saw zigzag as a fancy feature they didn't need, believe it or not. Uh, but this machine is a great example, guys, of when you find a used sewing machine that looks like a good candidate one that you might want, and it's very clean. And I mean clean as in almost never used. Um, and of course it was in a carrying case and I could tell it was kept indoors all of its life, not in a basement or a garage. And I want to emphasize that when you are looking to, to a machine uh, to, to use, you, you find a vintage machine, just because it's clean and shiny does not mean it does not require a full overhaul. Every sewing machine that I restore, no matter how pretty or ugly it may look when I get it, all of them get a full overhaul and going through because many of these machines, you know, they're more than a half century. Some of them are a century old and you just don't know. You don't know how long they've been sitting and these are all steel machines and they require maintenance. And so, uh, so that's, that's one of the things I've noticed about machines is you can't assume because they look like they didn't get used much that they don't require uh, effort to get going again. So I thought I would share that with you guys. Sort of, sort of very, very different from the, from the old Singer 15 there, the old uh, iron size that's sitting there. Uh, next up we have an early, not the earliest, but an early Singer 60, excuse me, a Singer 99 model. Now you've seen my videos. I have a video on the 99 that I've done. This is an earlier version. And the reason I know this is because while some of the decals look familiar, if you look closely, the bobbin winder is uh, one of the older designs. You'll also see it has a, a chrome rim on the hand wheel there. Uh, it also comes with what looks like the original foot pedal. Uh, now, one, one of the things this reminds me of is I've got a number of ideas for new videos for you guys, and one of those is uh, when it's a good idea to restore a vintage sewing machine foot pedal, and when you might want to consider replacing it uh, 
with uh, a new generic digital, or not digital, but uh, electronic foot pedal. And there are reasons for that, and we'll talk about it. And this, again, is a machine that uh, is wonderfully strong and powerful. It looks like it has uh, an older cord system, so I'm going to have to take a look at that and decide if that is salvageable or if I'm going to need to replace it because that's safety is a very important thing with anything electrical, and that includes sewing machines. This uh, particular machine came with, one of the reasons I chose to, to take it on as a project, it came with its original uh, beautiful bent wood carrying case, and it has the original Singer key that could lock it. Um, back in the day, other than the featherweight, this would have been considered uh, uh, the most, one of the most portable machines you could get, if you want to call them portable. Uh, let's see, and let me now, I will move over to show you a few more machines I have. I have quite a lot of work cut out for me here, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, put those into the video. Next up, folks, is a Neki BCJ. Now this machine is an early, I want to say late 1940s, early 50s, like 50, 51, perhaps even 48. This is a wonderful uh, example of some of the best work Necky did. You, you guys know my favorite Necky machines come from the late 40s, early 50s. And one of the great things about them is that they are built with uh, an incredibly heavy, uh, heavy specification for a home sewing machine. And one of the things I did was I looked at this machine and it appeared to be fine when I saw it, but one of the things I did was I looked at its thread path. And as I was following along, I realized that there was a thread guide missing on the um, needle bar. And so I am currently looking for a replacement for this. And that's one of the things you guys want to look for when you're looking, you want to decide, hey, I want to get this old vintage sewing machine. If there's any way you can find out what the thread guides look like. Now, many machines will have all their thread guides. It's not often a problem. I wouldn't say this is something that happens a lot, but when it does, you can't really, um, you can't really use a machine if it's not threaded properly. So I'm going to be investigating a way to find that guide. And while the necky zigzaggers are my favorite from this period, uh, it's really hard to turn down uh, the option of rescuing a, a necky from this time. They are some of the finest machines made, uh, and, and it's definitely something to consider. And I'll be going over when I start talking about the machine, some of the other areas I'll be working on in restoration. And not to be left out is yet uh, another Kenmore 158 0.1941 free arm sewing machine. This is a machine I've restored a number of times, and you folks have seen me uh, do videos on them. When I find them, it's hard to say no, because remember that in the vintage era, you didn't have that many uh, free arm sewing machines. I'll try to get this thing to be still. It looks like we're on a boat here. Um, and this one came to me. Someone has apparently tried to uh, take a look at the uh, thread tension assembly, and they've taken it apart, and possibly they were having issues with thread tension. Uh, unfortunately, they took it apart and left it in kind of a pile, and it's in a bag here. You guys can see that, and with some bobbins and things. So I'll be taking a look at it. It's possible that it wasn't broken, but they were trying to fix it, if I can't get it to work, then I will be looking at finding a re replacement. Kenmore's are known to be really uh, user-friendly with tension. They're not commonly machines that have issues with tension. And this machine came to me missing its thread spool pins up here, up top. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about how to, to save a machine that's missing its spool pins, because you're definitely going to need those. But uh, this, again, is one of the machines that Sears uh, commissioned from the Maruzen Company in Japan, and they were basically looking for uh, a machine that could compete with Bernina. And I'm going to uh, ask you guys at some point if you think 
one of these specific machines, these wonderful free arms from, this is like early to mid 70s, and they are some of the last of the all metal machines ever made. See if you think that they can really uh, hold a candle to Bernina, uh, because these were Sears, uh, this was Sears' attempt to have a machine like a Bernina for sale. Okay, and last but not least, I have, I've been promising you folks that I'm going to do some new videos on the white rotary. Uh, some of you have these machines and they might be called Kenmore rotary. They might be called Franklin or Sears rotary. You will also see names like Dressmaster. And there are a few others, but they were all made in Cleveland, Ohio by the White Sewing Machine Company. And as I mentioned before, White was a big producer. They weren't small like a lot of the companies. They were second only to Singer. And this, this particular type of machine, whether it's the White or the Kenmore, uh, these are some of the most unloved, underappreciated sewing machines I think I've ever come across. And I did a, a survey on YouTube to see, okay, uh, is, you know, uh, you know, what's out there? And some people have done some really nice videos on these, but I wanted to, to add, because there's not a lot of information out there, and I suspect there are many of you who have these machines and you want to use them, but you've gotten stuck because there are some common troubleshooting issues with them. It's not the machine's fault. Actually, the machines are built like tanks. When I say they're underappreciated, I really mean that. They are some of the best machines ever made. Uh, and they, they sold in very large numbers. But uh, I'm going to be covering things, uh, sort of sharing with you folks, things that range everywhere from what to look for, uh, ways to troubleshoot these machines. We're going to talk about the motors. Some of you have had questions about these motors. Uh, they typically look like this that you see here. Uh, we're going to talk about how to overhaul one of the motors and, and make sure that it's ready to sew again. There's some of the the strongest motors ever put on vintage machines, and they are uh, beautifully simple uh, to get access to. Uh, and that's not a surprise. This is probably uh, late 1940s, I'm gonna guess when this was made. And uh, I will be going over some of, the, some of the things you might want to look for when you are looking at a, a rotary machine. One of the things that's typical, and I took this off to show you all, is that very often, this is called the bobbin plate, and very often they're missing. They're missing from the machine because they, they come off easily, which is great when you're trying to take it out, but, uh, but you can get replacements for these. So if you get one of these machines and it doesn't have the plate, it's not a loss. You can get a replacement. Uh, I bought this machine and saw immediately that it was missing, it was missing a, uh, a knob just like this that goes on this uh, reverse stitch lever, and I can get one. I can find a used vintage part for it, which is great. One of the things I'm also gonna be doing, I'm gonna create more than one video on this machine, and I'm really gonna try to focus in for you folks on things like threading. So when I'm showing you this machine, it literally, I haven't started work on it. This is kind of how I found it. It was threaded up top, and uh, I'm gonna pull this out for you. One of my goals, primary goals, and one of the reasons I chose to look for another rotary was so that I could make, uh, I'm gonna make an attempt at showing you all how to thread this. This is one of the most requested things I have gotten from people is, how in the world do you thread a rotary machine? And they're not difficult once you know how, but unlike the Singer user manuals, the user manuals for these machines are not illustrated all that well. And if, if you don't have really good light, uh, it's hard to photograph or record this. So I'm not doing this today, but I wanted to show you guys, I want to be able to record and show you how to properly thread one of the bobbing cases. This is the bobbing case for the machine. And also how to thread the, the uh, machine itself how to take the feet off. It's actually, like I say, it's a beautifully simple machine to oil, to maintain, to thread, but it works differently. Uh, another thing that's different, of course, is that the hand wheels uh, rotate away from you instead of towards you, which is true uh, for the singers. 
or I should say is opposite on Singer's. And so again, these machines are built like tanks and I, and I honestly, when you look at what machines, um, when, you, when you go to buy them, they are, they are everywhere, but they are not as well known as Singer machines. And I just think, uh, you know, I've used these before. I've restored them and I've sold them. They make amazing stitches and they are strong. I mean, tractor strong machines. Uh, and they're not difficult to find parts for because again, they were sold in very large numbers. And so, uh, again, the fact that it was missing a knob, I didn't, didn't hesitate at all. I, I know I can find one. But the main reason I got this, uh, in addition to the fact that some of the best sewing tables ever made were, were made for the White and the Kenmore machines, uh, is I wanted to be able to video, uh, particularly setting the machine up and threading it, because that's one of the, uh, one of the, the the most common questions I get. And then the other one will be how to uh, uh, clean and or replace the rubber pulley or the rubber motor pulley. Here's a close up shot of what I was mentioning, folks. Of course, this machine is um, uh, the example that White, the White Company had for a machine that would be without uh, belts. It is beltless, right? It uses a pulley with a, with a rubber bushing on it. And these, uh, very often they work just fine, but they can be replaced. And there are places to get uh, the replacements and putting them on is not hard. And I'm gonna show you guys how. So the, again, there will be a series of videos on, on this rotary. Uh, but again, I wanted to, to, to purchase this specifically because I just think there are not enough videos on YouTube showing people how to use these machines. And uh, it's a fantastic machine to have. Many of you may have, may have one in your family, or you may know someone who, 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 who is trying to sell one or even give it to you. But um, they are, like I say, they're one of the most misunderstood and underappreciated machines that I've ever come across. So there you have it, guys. These are some of the machines that I'm gonna be making videos on. And I wanted to kind of give you a heads up on what uh, I'm going to be working on as we go into the spring. A few other ideas I've got for videos, and I'd love to get your feedback. Let me know uh, in the comments section down here if, um, if some of the ideas I'm sharing with you look like uh, videos you'd like to, to have me make. Uh, one, a couple of other ideas I've got is what I call troubleshooting, common reasons why vintage sewing machines uh, won't work. You know, you get stuck. There's some kind of malfunction. And we'll talk about the most common reasons. Uh, and I can promise you 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not because the machine is broken uh, or the machine is misbehaving. It's because it is usually user error. Uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, even from people who are experienced sewers, because you still have to know the machine quite well. So we're gonna talk about that. That's, that's one video also that will be coming up. Another one, as you can, well, you can see here, uh, the picture of this beautiful table. Uh, this is a table that was common to White and Kenmore's. It was an upgrade table, and it's just one of a number of tables I'm going to do a video on. I wanna talk about sewing machine tables because it, they are, again, along this theme of being underappreciated, most people treat sewing tables uh, uh, as no big deal. And I th actually think they are a big deal and are probably better made than most of the furniture in most everyone's home. Uh, and I know that's a bold statement, but I, I believe it's true. And, and I'll be talking about that in one of my videos. And then I'm gonna be discussing with you all uh, another, another topic that often comes up, which is the term industrial. I want to discuss uh, the term domestic versus industrial when it comes to sewing machines. A lot of people make claims online about what is industrial and what is industrial strength, and I want to kind of clear the air and set that straight. It's, it's uh, I mean, it's, it's not really a controversy. There are domestic or home sewing machines, and there are industrials, and there are clear and distinct differences, and we're going to talk about those. And uh, Again, I wanted to sort of share with you the video ideas I have 
coming up. If you have a specific idea for a video you would like to see that I haven't made and I haven't talked about here, let me know. Put it down in the comments section. And uh, I guess this, this video is kind of a coming attractions. I wanted to kind of lay out for you folks what, what I have in store for at least early spring. And let me know if there's uh, uh, an idea you have for a video that, that I haven't discussed so far. Let me know and we will uh, we'll work our, and do our best to, to, to get something set up for you. Thanks everyone for watching. I so appreciate your support of the channel. And uh, this channel was originally created simply to, uh, to have a place to post videos for the machines I was restoring and selling. And it has, it has uh, blossomed into something far greater than what I had imagined. And uh, it looks like I'm gonna be expanding the channel because uh, we're, we're getting a lot more interest than what we originally hoped for. So thanks so, so much to all of you. And uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel and you can get notifications from YouTube when I am posting new videos. And now you have an idea of some of the uh, videos that I'm gonna be working on and bringing to the channel soon. So stay tuned and thanks for watching folks. Bye-bye.